the writer's dream. This is a show where authors can talk about how they write their books, how they publish them, and how they market their books. You can find us on YouTube. Just search my name, Linda Maria Frank. Click on my picture, and you will see interviews with many Long Island writers. Most of the writers I interview are local. You would be amazed at how many writers there are on Long Island. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube. Um, and I think that's probably, oh, and you can find us at LTV. I'm sorry. I knew we had some, uh, another one. So our guest today is Celine Keating, and she has written The Stark Beauty of Last Things. And uh, she's done some previous works, uh, Layla, uh, Play For Me, and numerous magazine articles. She's also the coordinator of On Montauk, a literary celebration. So welcome, Celine. Thank you so much. And thank you, Linda, for inviting me. It's really exciting to be here. My pleasure. So if you'd like to add anything to your vast accomplishments here. <laughs> uh, no, that's fine. I have a... Um, some literary short fiction, and uh, I also do some music reviewing, which is off topic. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, lately, the last year or so, I've been helping to facilitate a workshop uh, called the Book Inc. that started in New Jersey, but is now virtual. So um, that's what I've been busy with, as well as fiction. Sure that is a busy endeavor. <laughs> yes. Anything having to do with books seems to be. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about uh, the star beauty of, la of last things, please. Sure. Well, um, I'll tell you the story that what the story is, and then maybe a little bit about how I came to write it. Uh, the novel is uh, about, as you said, the hamlet of Montauk, which is a tiny coastal area on the tip of Long Island. Uh, if your Long Island audience, is, if your audience is mostly Long Islanders, they'll know it well, I'm sure. And it's a very special, precious place. Um, and this story switches point of view among four different characters. Three of them are local and whose lives are defined by the coastal landscape. And the fourth is an outsider. So the three characters are Julian, who's a landscape artist and a motel owner. Teresa, who works in a bar and who lives at a trailer park that is threatened by uh, erosion, sea level rise. And the last uh, local character is Molly, who with her boyfriend, Billy, is being pressured to sell their little beach home to a developer. And the fourth character sort of kicks the story off when he arrives. He's uh, orphaned in childhood. He comes to Montauk for the weekend and reconnects with the man who was his big brother when he was young. Uh, and that leads to his receiving an unexpected legacy where he, it will be up to him to determine the fate of the last parcel of large undeveloped land in Montauk. That parcel is imaginary. Oh, good. Uh, yes, that's imaginary. <laughs> but that sort of starts the uh, story off. So that's that's the basic outlines of the story. It moves from character to character's point of view as it proceeds through the decision-making process and the conflicts in the town. Uh, just for my own uh, information, when you switch from character to character, do you do it in first person? It's all third-person point of view. Okay. Um, but there are sections, little brief uh, descriptive sections go that go by the seasons, spring, late autumn, that kind of thing, that are the voice of the town itself. Oh. And those are sort of a more distant, omniscient, uh, faraway voice that's almost like the voice of Montauk speaking. You know, it's amazing to me, because I go to Montauk often enough, that so much of it has not changed, and yet there is quite a bit that has changed. I mean, I, I've been going to Montauk since I was in college. From, no, since I was a little kid, my father wow. took us on it. Like, it was like four hours to drive out to Montauk. right. There were no roads, <laughs> but well, um, yeah. So what was your inspiration to write this? Well, that's it. Well, like you, um, I grew up in sort of the, I grew up in Long Island, but it was the border of Queens and Nassau. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I didn't visit Montauk until I was in college. And then later I went for my first long weekend there with the man who had become my husband. And we camped at Hither Hills. And I was just enthralled. I just loved it. And I badgered him basically until we purchased a small co-op apartment 
um, and it became like a weekend place and I would go out there to write. Um, and I just wanted to, I was enchanted. I just wanted to capture Montauk on the page. And then over time, I began to see these changes that made me nervous. I had grown up, as I said, right at the border of Queens and Nassau at a period when it was really rapidly developing. And all my little favorite haunts, like little meadows and little woods, were all getting gobbled up and, and made into housing developments. And I was really worried about that happening in Montauk. And also there were climate change issues too, like more ferocious storms and beaches being eroded. So all of that became part of the inspiration. So it was both sort of a, I think of it as a kind of love song to Montauk, but it also became over time as I was writing a little bit of an elegy because I was fearful of what could happen. Uh, there's a lot of people there fighting very hard to keep it the special place that it is. And I'm very hopeful that that will that will succeed, but there is the danger of so many different things that impact a small uh, community like that and other beach communities as well, you know, special places that need preserving and it's hard to do that. Well, I look at what's happened in Hampton Bays. Um, oh. It's really, I, I don't know where the water comes from and where the waste goes. There's The houses are right one on top of the other. It's really, uh, very sad. I I also grew up in Queens, but I grew up on the other border. I grew up on the border of Queens and Brooklyn. Ah. And my family business was we had a flower farm. So I grew up oh, on a flower wow. farm. In oh. And I'm actually <laughs> writing a memoir about it because my grandfather built the house that we lived in. So, uh, and talk about seeing changes. Uh huh. Because my memories go back to the 1940s. So. Wow. So, I mean, it was a huge swamp where I lived. Amazing. See, yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yes. I and see the Empire State Building. So, I hope you have pictures. I do. I Well, I have some pictures, yeah, but uh, not as many as I'd like. I want to go into the libraries in Queens and see what I can find. But anyway, yeah. let's talk about your book. Well, it's uh, it's interesting, though, what you say because of the gardening or the flower aspect. Just one of my themes has to do with the importance of nature and how so many people have no connection with it. But you, as somebody who grew up with a, with, you know, a flower farm, I mean, that must have absolutely well, penetrated your very being. To have, it to was have a farm. I mean, everything was seasonal. I mean, the, the big seasons for us were Easter and Christmas, but there was stuff in between. And then, of course, my grandmother, who grew up on a uh, on an estate in Poland, uh, and her father was the estate manager, uh, she was the one who grew the vegetables and did all, wow. the and all that. So I, I, I'm so familiar with all of that stuff. And and I find it, I was walking in my little town here of Massapequa Park, which of course is everybody's on a 60 by 100 plot. And there was this man sitting in front of his house with a big uh, galvanized steel tub, and he was scalding tomatoes and peeling them. Uh, and uh, I looked at him and I said, oh my gosh, this is exactly what we would do at the end of the season with all of the tomatoes. So, wow. so farming is like part of my blood. One of the volunteer jobs I did was in Central Park. I was a gardener. Oh, I'd how fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I remember cool. seeing people. <laughs> it's like, I lived most of my adult life in Manhattan, um, and I would see people, you know, planting and cultivating in both Riverside Park and Central Park. So thank you for all the, that that work you did. Yeah. So tell me about the characters. Let's let's hear more about the characters. Sure. They were fun to write. Um, I over time, as I was spending time in Montauk, I would just sort of look at people and imagine what their lives were like. And I really wanted to show these forces, not as sort of big ideas, but on a human level. So, you know, what is it like for somebody who's a painter to be seeing the landscape that she uses as her inspiration to be threatened? You know, and she's also, um, as I said, she and her husband own a little bungalow colony with their, their son, Max. And uh, they want to give him a, a wild and wonderful childhood roaming the woods and the beaches. And so it's it's an idyllic lifestyle, but they also, as a small mom and pop, have those pressures. Um, and then Teresa is a very sort of angry character. She's the daughter of Otto, who's the big brother to Clancy, 
it's getting confusing, I probably. But anyhow, she's the bartender who lives in the trailer park. Very independent, um, very uh, solitary, um, very fierce in her opinions, etc. cetera. Um, and she's an antithesis to, to Clancy. She resents him and, and they are sort of at odds. And then Molly is, is the opposite. She's just a lovely, young, sweet, open to anything, happy, in love with her boyfriend, in love with Montauk, very young, um, and um, can't bear to give up the, the beach house that they have. But it's a tempting prospect because, you know, these small places now are worth like millions of dollars. Yes. <laughs> so it's so I was trying to show those aspects on real, real people's lives. You know, what does it feel like if you suddenly can't have the the access that you did? You know, you now have to live somewhere else. You don't have the water anymore. You don't have the beach nearby. Like, how does that feel on a human level, on an individual level? And then Clancy is um, sort of a lost character. He's um, as I said, he was orphaned. He grew up in my book. He's in Astoria, has no real awareness of nature or woods or hiking or anything like that. So this is all foreign to him. But he has to see through this responsibility, this legacy that he's inherited of making this decision. And he's very torn. So he tries to get input from various people on what's the best use of land? What should I decide? And um, so... He's he's um, gradually over time, the connection to the people and the land actually becomes his method of personal growth and how he finds a home finally that he's never really had. Um, so there's conflicts. There's but there you know most of the uh, most of the characters interact with the, each other at a minimum and then with other characters. So it's a it's a pretty wide. Ta uh, tapestry to try to capture the essence of the town in some ways. So it sounds like Clancy is the growth character. Mm -hmm. I would say so. He was He's the one who really grows into what Montauk is all about. Yes. And um, the other characters help him to do that. Exactly. Yeah. That's... I mean, I would say Teresa also undergoes a fair amount of change from being very angry to being more open. Mm -hmm. um, and then Julian and Molly change a little bit less. So it's a little bit um, Teresa and Clancy who, but Clancy primarily, as you say. Where where do the, these characters come from? Are these real people you base this on or um, made them all up? Yeah, they're all imaginary, though. I did, you know, I saw people at different points where I'd, I'd be, my imagination would get sparked. So, for instance, Gosman's Dock, which, of course, if you've been to Montauk, you know that. And they have their wonderful fish market. And there was a woman there. I would, I sort of watched her and thought, I wonder what her life is like. Like, what must it be like to be young and be working in this fish market? And so she became the basis of the Molly character. And then there would be these sort of tough young women who are on the docks and in the bars. And um, I would be curious about them. And that became the Teresa character. Um there's also a very feisty older woman who is an environmentalist and a teacher in the school. And she's definitely based on somebody I knew uh, who was a real environmental leader out there, but was not afraid to make enemies. So she was somebody you either loved or hated. Uh, so she became the model for my character, Grace. Um, and Clancy was the one that in, was completely invented. Uh, I don't know quite where he came from, but it was when I imagined him into being that suddenly the story frame came to me. And I, I, I had sort of these disparate stories and they didn't hang together in one big plot until I imagined him. And then I realized, oh, having the outsider come in with this task, that's what's going to be the propulsive thing to bring the story along. I don't know if you have those that happened to you with your writing where oh, sure yeah um i i think that uh, having somebody come in from the outside and um not knowing really what the dynamics are when you're living there you're kind of immersed in the dynamics and as as you've explained your characters are kind of into their own lives but if you come in from the outside i think 
if you're an open-minded person, you tend to see more. And, uh, and that's that's what he does in your book. Um, what I love is that you've made the setting a character. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about the, the seasons and uh, how you explain that, would you like to read a passage? Can you find one of them? Oh, sure. Uh, I can read one of those passages, maybe, because yes. they're short. Um, I think that would be lovely. Okay, I'll, I'll actually read the first. Um, why not? Sure. So this is uh, just a paragraph. Early autumn. A narrow isthmus, a mere thread, connects the Montauk Peninsula to the rest of Long Island, formed of piles of rubble left behind as the glaciers retreated eons ago. Here, there are pockets of forest, scarred and fluted cliffs. Prairie grass still shimmers on the last acres of downs, and beach sand is streaked with dark red garnet. Here there is land that has never been built upon, places with an unbroken chain from the time of the glaciers until now. So when the white froth of ocean rises up and the sun's glow sets fire to the thin strand of cloud that rests like a ribbon along the horizon, it would be easy to believe that nothing has changed, that all is as it was and will remain. Yes. <laughs> so it's sort of what you were saying about how in some ways it is the same. Luckily, yeah. about 70% of the peninsula is actually preserved in various parks. So there are these spots where you, know, you can find arrowheads and, you know, nothing's ever been built on the, that land. You know, the Indians were there, but. I know when, when you drive along that narrow isthmus and then you come to the point where you're at a high point and you can see the ocean. Uh, yes. <laughs> <Does it? That's... laughs> I'd like to read some reviews, if you don't mind. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so I can't say enough about how much I enjoyed this book. The characters, the twisty plots, the detailed descriptions, and the setting of Montauk, a place of great natural beauty, all drew me in completely. When I miss being at the ocean all the time, <laughs> I will, <laughs> from now on, uh, I'm sorry, having, I'm sorry, from now on, we'll have the stark beauty of lost things to turn to passages that take me there. That's beautiful. Yeah. And that's from Alice Elliott. Alice Elliott Dark, Dark. Member of uh, Fellowship Point and In the Gloaming. And we have a, another one here. This novel embraces uh, Montauk in many ways, especially its fragile beauty. The characters have to negotiate their relationships uh, to that endangered beauty as well as their own relationships. The author, author's love for Montauk is evident in the pages that will turn quickly. That's Tom Clavin. I, I kind of know Tom Clavin because I belong uh -huh. to Long Island Authors Group. And uh -huh. He is a, like a charter member. So uh, another great Long Island writer. So um, tell me about uh, anything else you would like to say about the book before I get into the nitty gritty of publishing and marketing. Uh, no, I think we can move on. I think I've covered anything that I would want to say. I don't want to give away any plot spoilers, no, no. but I, I do have hurricane and arson, or not arson, fire, floods. <laughs> I've brought in a lot of this strum and drum. <laughs> That's on Fire Island. I have a friend who lives on Fire Island, and this is uh, ongoing stories as uh, the fires, the floods, the hurricanes and and the uh the deer and the onslaught of of tourists and blah 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 all over right because <laughs> long island's so special so um tell me about how you publish tell me about she writes press she writes press is really terrific um it's an all women's press it is what's called a hybrid which is um they consider it like a partnership between the author and the press. It's pricey now, unfortunately, which is a little bit of a barrier to writers. But um, I had an agent. I've had several agents for my, for each of my books. I've had an agent. Each time the agent was not able to sell my books. Uh, my first novel, Layla, I found a small, small press. That's a terrific small press, still thriving. I don't know how they do it. But it didn't have much distribution or much um 
reach into the marketplace. So that's why I chose She Writes this time around um, and with Play For Me. When uh, both books, my agent wasn't thrilled. Uh, she w initially was a little hesitant about a hybrid. She thought, um, she sort of said, why don't you put the book on the shelf, move on. But I said, I'm not so young. Uh, oh, if I was 30 years wow. old, maybe I would. Yes. Uh, I, but I, I thought, no, I not at it. this point. At this point, I'd I just want the book out in the world. So fast forward to She Writes. Um, they have traditional distribution, which means that they have yes. sales force and salespeople who go around and, and sell the book. So you do sell many more. And it's not about the money. It's about having people read your work and wanting exactly. them to write. So... Um, it's well worth it. I found with my first book that I recouped the money that I had invested in it. Um, I'm hoping I'll do that again. But it's a wonderful community as well. The publisher is Brooke Warner, and she's just a dynamo. Um, she will have many, many webinars for authors teaching us about marketing, about publicity. Um, she's She has office hours every week that you can attend and ask questions, very transparent about every aspect of it. So, and there's also a bunch of Facebook groups and other ways authors relate to each other and support each other. And that's just a gold mine. You know, I didn't have any of that with my first novel. I really loved the publisher. They did a great job, but there was none of that community, that sense of community. So if, you know, if you're lucky enough and you get a huge contract from some major publisher, more power to you. But um, if not, I think She Writes Press is one of the best alternatives out there, especially for books like mine that I think are sort of they, they're literary fiction, but they're very accessible, but they're not blockbuster. You know, they're not going to be major commercial successes. It's like most books. Right. But they're the kind of books that I like to read. Yeah. I love, you know, that's where I go for my fiction. Um, I, I think when you write, and um, see if you agree with me, when you write, you have to decide what it is you want out of it. Mm -hmm. Of course, you want to produce a book and you want to get it out into the world, but... Do you want the bestseller? Do you want a movie? What What do you want? And and I I agree with what you said before. Uh, I I just loved my stories and I wanted someone to read them, especially mm -hmm. kids, young, mm -hmm. because I taught for many years and I thought ah. something to offer them. So that, that's wonderful. Please, because I do have, you know, I do have a readership. It's small, but it's enough for me. And I was really in my 60s when I started this so <laughs> that's wonderful what a what an inspiring story well I, I don't know some days I don't feel that way we only have a couple of minutes left so I was hoping that you would tell me first of all um a little bit of advice to writers mm -hmm. and your message to readers you can take either one or both. <laughs> <laughs> well, to writers, I would say looking back, the one thing I wish I had done was to get my work out there a little sooner. I was a bit, well, as many of us are, um, afraid of putting your work out there, but also worrying that it needed to be more perfect. And I found that, you know, it's it's better to get it out there and deal with rejection, deal with maybe uh, good criticism that can help you develop just get going and so and also the other the other thing i did correctly i think was to sm start really small so many many authors will say oh i finished a story i'm going to send it off to the new yorker don't do that <laughs> this makes much more sense to start building like you know little by little write articles for small local papers um send to tiny little presses that will be much more open to your work. Then you sort of build your credentials bit by bit and you have a foundation. I think that's very important. So those would be two tips, as well as what I was just saying, to find a community, you know, a writer's group, classes. 
At some point also, if if like me, I've gotten to a point sometimes with my, this particular book especially, where I just didn't feel it was fully there, but I was like at my wit's end, what more? I could rewrote and rewrote and rewrote. I hired somebody just to give it a read and give me some feedback. I think that's a wise thing if you yes, can afford it. Yes. yes. Um, not just your friends and, you know, the other writers, but somebody who's a professional and, and um, may bring something new to your imagination. Even if you don't take any of the advice, it will spark something. So I think those would be my words of advice for writers. And of course, keep writing, be consistent. I mean, the obvious things, um, even if it's just 15 minutes a day, keep that keeps the imagination alive rather than say, oh, I'm going to just wait till the weekend when I have two hours. Much better to do it on a daily basis if you can possibly, even if it's just a short time. You know, there are times when I used to have to move my car from one side of the street to the other, and I would go to the car and have to sit in it while I waited, and I'd bring a notepad, and I would find those very valuable writing sessions, as That's wacky great. as that sounds. That is great advice and words of wisdom, and we are out of time, and I thank you Perfect. so much. It's a oh, wonderful thank you. book, and I wish you great success with it. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking with you, Linda, and I will follow... Um, you from now on. I'll be watching your show. Yeah, absolutely. And I look forward to reading your book.